Okay, good afternoon everyone and welcome to the Foreign Correspondence Club Hong Kong, which my humble opinion is the best press club in the world. My name is Hanna Mina Tanninen and I work as Hong Kong correspondent for the leading Finnish financial newspaper Kaupalehti and I'm also the, one of the club's two vice presidents. Um, uh, the Hong Kong Foreign Correspondence Club was um, founded 70 years ago by journalists, but today we enjoy a very large and diverse member base, all from artists to lawyers to uh, maritime industry experts. We do organize events such as lunch talks like this, seminars, uh, photo exhibitions, and live music whenever that is allowed. Again, um, to learn more about the FCC and how you can join the club, you can go to our website um, fcc.org.hk and you can learn more on our social media. Um, we have the, those of you who are already members of the club or are friends with one, we have a uh, member, <laughs> member of the club. We do have an other event coming up, which is We Don't Dance for Nothing film screening on Monday, July 18th. And then with the film screening, you can enjoy the best uh, movie snacks, which is a full buffet with um, free flow of wine here at this very room. Um, Today's event, where we talk about um, COVID-19 in Hong Kong, um, before we, uh, I start um, introducing these two gentlemen who do not, <laughs> don't need introduction, I would like to have it on the internet record that I am just, um, how would you say, a substitute host. This event was put together by my wonderful board, uh, fellow board member, Olivia Parker. She couldn't be here today, but, but, but for the record, this, this event is put together by her. She just couldn't be here today. So, so thank you, Olivia, if, if you're listening this at your newsroom. But now <laughs> to, to the gentleman who sit on my right and your left, because you're looking you know, from the other direction, we have Dr. Ben Cowling. He is currently chair professor of, of epidemiology and co-director of the WHO collaborating Center for Infectious Diseases, Epidemiology and Control at the School of Public Health at HKU, Hong Kong University. His research interests include the epidemiology of COVID-19, influenza, and other respiratory viruses. Since early 2020, his work on COVID-19 has supported evidence-based control of the original virus and the more recent variants. He holds major research grants to study how individual measures of immunity translate to population immunity and to identify optimal vaccination strategies for influenza and COVID-19. Uh, Mr. Aaron Bush is known as at Tripperhead on Twitter, where he has nearly, uh, I think, over 30,000 mm. followers. Yeah, this yeah, this was printed a couple of weeks ago, so yeah. Here it says nearly 30, but over 30,000 followers. He reports daily on the COVID-19 situation in Hong Kong for English language users. After studying journalism at Curtin University in Perth, Western Australia, Aaron embarked on a career as a radio newsreader, newspaper journalist, and finally a breakfast radio DJ before pivoting to stay-at-home dad to his two children. In addition of, of these two gentlemen, we also have um, those of you who uh, follow COVID, English COVID news on Twitter, uh, Joel Chang, who, who does a lot of work to uh, keep up with our vaccination statistics, uh, Danny Lee, who keeps us updated with <laughs> all the flight information, and Jane Wong, who monitors of, uh, of um, uh, the like the cybersecurity of, of different issues. So thank you, the three of you, you uh, those of you who are watching this online, you cannot see, but, but they're sitting here. And thank you for, for all the work that you do also for our community. But now, yeah, thank you, yes, yes. So round of applause to everyone. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, they're friends. <laughs> um, anyway. Now, now that I have you know, completed my uh, almost five minute monologue, uh, gentlemen, um, if we start f before we go to all the COVID questions, don't worry, if you could please, both of you, um, tell a bit more about how did you end up on this stage today? For Aaron, how, why and how did you decide to spend significant amount of time and your personal resources to bring COVID information to all of us, which has been extremely helpful? And Ben, how did you, ended up to your field and did you ever imagine <laughs> to be um you know to get asked so many questions because usually scientists are like no one asks me ever anything so yeah okay so um back in 2020 before 
I, well, I was in Australia at the time, so I saw that there was something happening. I decided to start writing the data down on a spreadsheet. And then when I got back to Hong Kong, I just started watching press conferences and trying to find out more news about what's going on with COVID. And what I found was there was a dearth of English language news. It was hard to find anything that was happening in Hong Kong. So I figured out, I might as well just put it up on my Twitter. And I was just doing it for my own personal benefit, put it up there, and then people started to follow and ask questions and do whatever. So it sort of snowballed from there. And that's and now I do it every day. It's sort of a compulsion, I guess. Uh, if I miss a day, like if I don't tweet for 12 hours, somebody will WhatsApp me and go, are you OK? Um, and I'm like, oh, I was just sleeping. I didn't go to bed till 4 AM. But, uh, and that's how it comes. And then it, I get people like Joel in that help out with the, he does his vac stats, but he also does a heap of other stuff for me and just sends it to me privately with very little um, uh, acknowledgement. And there's Julian and there's Ryan and they, it sort of became this community of um, English language COVID in Hong Kong uh, to basically try to help everybody out. And I try to, have, that's all I do. Thank you. Yeah, for me, after I finished my PhD in the UK, I was looking for what to do next. And there was a job opportunity in Hong Kong created by uh, Professor Tony Headley and Dr. Gabriel Lung, as he was then a, a, uh, not yet a professor, to work on infectious disease epidemiology in Hong Kong after SARS. So the, the concept was try to strengthen Hong Kong's uh, potential response to a future SARS. Mm -hmm. And that was in 2004. Mm -hmm. It was kind of prescient. We were, were not sure if there was going to be another SARS or not. Um, so we did some work on, on looking back at what happened during SARS, did some work on influenza, and then almost 20 years later we do have another SARS, SARS-CoV-2. So I think because of all of the investment from the government into the universities to build up this area, I'm not, not only myself but a big group of people working with me uh, on, on infectious disease epidemiology. My team is I think 80 plus people now. So we have a lot of people working on this, okay. and it's, it's, it's fantastic that we have this capacity to, to study uh, COVID and mm -hmm. uh, to figure out what's going on and what we can do. Yeah, yeah well, uh, uh, definitely also shout out to, to all the scientists and, and, and people working on this, and I hope if, there, if there's something that, that we all learn from, the, uh, from this uh, pandemic is that just how incredibly important having good science and having good funding for science is. But going to the topic today, which even though Aaron and I, maybe we would have wanted to discuss cricket or, or ice hockey to, to the COVID situation in, in Hong Kong right now. So at the moment, what is the COVID situation in Hong Kong, basically number wise, variant wise, and are we all going to die or are we gonna have the 20,000 <laughs> uh, 20, infections? And like, if we now count out the vaccinations, which we can discuss later, but number wise, which variant are we on and how many people we have and how are we doing? Yeah, uh, at the moment we're, we're seeing about 3,000 confirmed cases a day and it's slowly going up. The numbers have been doubling, the numbers of confirmed cases have been doubling about every seven to 10 days. Uh, so it looks like they're going to continue for a little while longer. But actually the, the major reason why case numbers is particularly with 2.12.1, BA4, BA5, the reason why they're not exploding is likely because of the immunity that we have in Hong Kong from previous infections with BA2 in the fifth wave probably more than half of the population got infected, mm -hmm. and that immunity still carries over at the moment. Mm -hmm. It may not hold forever, but it carries over at the moment. And so the main reason that transmission is not exploding like it is in Europe, for example, with mm -hmm. BA5, is likely the, the immunity, the, the population immunity that we've built up. But it's difficult to predict exactly how much longer the current sixth wave is going to last, mm -hmm. whether the, 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 the 2.1, 4, and 5 are going to really become predominant, mm -hmm. because in Europe they are now. In the US they are now. Uh, most likely they will, but, but I don't think we'll have an enormous wave. My, my guess is uh, by early August, the numbers will start coming down again. Um, and my question to you last night on WhatsApp was why is BA 2.12.1 not still dying out? It's still winning. And, yeah. and it is, it doubled, yeah. I'm just looking yeah. at my notes here, it, yeah. it doubled in one day. It's yeah. up to 58 new cases. Whereas BA45 is still trucking along about half that. Yeah, and I, I feel like we haven't got a brilliant handle on the, the prevalence in the community because of the way that cases are identified and reported. It's not everybody. Yeah. So although there's 3,000 confirmed cases yesterday, there's most likely another 5,000 or more mm. unconfirmed cases. Yeah. 
people who were maybe, some of them knew they had COVID but didn't go for, for confirmation, didn't do the PCR, didn't report the RAT, mm. um, and maybe some people who didn't even know they've got it. Asymptomatic, yeah. mild symptoms, didn't even think they had COVID. So it's difficult to track exactly what's going on. Um, and that's one of the limitations, not only for us in Hong Kong, but around the world, mm. is very difficult to keep a handle on <laughs> COVID. Um, in Hong Kong, we actually have pretty good data compared to my, my, my collaborators in the US yeah. said it's a disaster. They've yeah. got no idea. Even though the numbers are going up or down, they can't tell because the surveillance is so difficult to interpret. But have we seen a spike in severe cases or hospitalizations or deaths and stuff such that? Like? No, there's very few, very few severe cases right now. Yeah. There's a lot of people in hospital, but the majority of people in hospital with COVID are not actually in isolation. So they're people that have recovered from COVID. No. The reason they're in hospital may or may not be because yeah. of COVID. They could have a complication yeah. because they had COVID and now they're recovering from the yeah. infection, but they've got other issues that have come up. Um, there'll be others who are going in for surgery, mm -hmm. but they test positive because they had COVID because mm -hmm. half, uh. half a percent of the people in Hong Kong right now have COVID. Mm -hmm. So some people going into hospital for surgery will have COVID. And so they're, they're confirmed, but that's not a hospitalization because of COVID. Mm -hmm. It's a hospitalization with COVID. But what I can't tell you is of the thousand or so people in hospital today, how many of them were put there by COVID versus how many of them were there anyway yeah. and happened to have COVID as well. It's a mix. And okay. figuring out that mix is, yeah. is, is, uh, is, is difficult. Okay. So, but we don't, you know, of course we have to, you know, take the situation seriously and the pandemic is not over. And, you know, at the FCC, we definitely definitely do, do our part with that one, but we don't have to be scared. Like, how, how scared do we have to be? Well, it's up to each individual. I mean, yeah, you, I mean, you have your own <laughs> level of, yeah. of fear about lots of different things, right? Yeah. Some people don't like flying. Some people don't like, yeah, I mean, people don't like a lot of things. And I think COVID is, is on some people's fear list and on other people it's not on their fear list. For myself, I had COVID in April. I had fever for three days and then I recovered. So, I mean, I'm, no, the I'm fear over that. In Hong Kong I'm sure I'll get it again. Far higher. Yeah than most of the rest of the world. I feel like it is. But I know that, I mean, a, a relative has got COVID at the minute and lost their sense of taste, and it's, it's not nice. Yeah. I know someone else who's got trouble, uh, respiratory problems after recovering from COVID. So I, it, it can be a big issue for, for some people. But I, I don't think it's something which should shut a city down for years. Um, I, I think we recognize why the measures were necessary in Hong Kong for the last two years, particularly. Um, we saw what happened in other parts of the world where they didn't have uh, the, the right kind of public health measures in place. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I think now that we have vaccines available, they, they, they reduce the risk very substantially of, of getting COVID and of getting sick with yeah. COVID. Okay. Um, speaking of vaccinations, because um, you especially, you, you follow the, uh, the numbers. So how are we doing with the vaccinations and um, mm -hmm. testing? Is, is there, you know, because the more you test, the more cases you find. So has mm -hmm. there been more... Um, I, th I think in English they're called residential lockdowns or yeah, how, how are we finding more cases and how are we doing with vaccinations? We're still doing like one to two. Last night there was two lockdowns. That was about 3,000 people. And what did we get, Joel? What did we get? Like 0.98% yeah. uh, testing positive last night. And it's been that sort of, I think you put that in a yeah. tweet thread. It's, yeah. it's been about 1%. Your mm. daily point prevalence is still quite low so I mean that I mean that these are the places they're targeting where they think there is COVID and it's still running about one percent yeah I, I mean if everybody in Hong Kong was tested today all of a sudden I feel like it'd be about one one or so percent PCR positive but that's a lot of people that have recovered already um, if you test them everyone today with an RAT I think it'd be about half a percent okay um so, <laughs> a very big question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. What is happening at the moment? Because we still have flight bans. Oh, oh, sorry, we do no longer have flight bans, but then we have like home isolation, and then we have quarantine, and then we still have quarantine camps. Now we're going to get introduced with wristbands and the health code. Based on the information that we have at the moment, which kind of measures do we have? And based on numbers and, and statistics, do they seem to do the job that they're supposed to do? Oh, so I do what we're doing and you can see if they sure. work. Um, <laughs> yeah. So at some point in July, probably, we're going to move to the health code system, yeah. which uh, 
we were talking about months ago, it was always going to be the progression the government was going to go. You don't build a co like a leave home safe with the health code already built in and then not progress to it. So it wasn't the version I thought they were going to come out with, to be honest, but it's going to be yellow code for inbound travellers, which means you can go to work or school, but you can't go to re restaurants or hospitals or um, aged care centres, any high risk areas for the time that they give you the yellow code, which they haven't said how long that's going to be yet either. So everything's a maybe. And then the red code, which uh, starts tomorrow, right? Um, the wristbands will go out at least, whether the red code's working, but the wristbands for home isolation will start and then they get the isolation order, which still sits at seven days, right? I think. I don't know. Yeah. I don't as far as I'm change. aware, it's still yeah. seven days. Uh, they've yeah. got this fixation with seven. So everything's seven days at mm. some point. And the last we heard, those testing positive and their families for BA 2.12.1 and BA 4.5 all get sent to quarantine. So they'll be in Penny's Bay at the moment. Um, there hasn't been a change on that until, like the fifth wave, until those two variants overtake BA 2.2 in a big way like BA 2.2 did over in March, they'll continue that rule where you get isolated in quarantine but as the numbers rise and they can't find anywhere to put them then they'll change the rules again I guess okay so so if we don't now count the people who fly in from Hong Kong if you happen to be in Hong Kong mm. and you get tested positive and then with the new wristband rule and then all of those so what happens to you after you test positive in Hong Kong Wow I'll find out tomorrow probably yeah but at the moment because it's BA 2.2 is still the prevalent it's like 95% of all the cases. Yeah. If you have the system, if your apartment has two toilets yeah. and you have the ability to isolate in a bedroom, mm -hmm. you'll still get home isolation. Right. So it, that won't change. And that's, they said 60% of those under isolation orders at the moment are at home. That's like 12,000 people at the moment yeah. are at home and will be in this wristband, yeah. red code right. thing. For the rest, they either end up in hospital or they end up in, um, if they can't, there's the five um, close contact camps now, I think. Sai Kung, Penny's Bay, Cosmo, which is used for inbound close contact, and Cam Luck. So there might be four at the moment. Um, so there's a close contact camps, plus there's the positive camps, and I think that's what we're at at the moment. Okay, so, so, if, so if you get tested positive, you will be staying at home, but then your close contacts will be shipped to... Not if you have the apartment that's got two toilets. Okay. Uh, he's, and I mean, it's, everything's at the discretion of CHP and Department of Health. They decide when you fill in the rat positive, which is how most people are testing positive, yeah. um, you have to explain your living circumstances. And if, you're listen, if, if you've got enough space at home to isolate, then you can. So now we mentioned the uh, wristbands, isolations, uh, testing, about testing, health code and everything. So from a, like a fire virus uh, management point of view, are these measures doing what they're supposed to do or not, or how they're working? Uh, at, at the moment, the, the high level objective for virus control is not completely clear. We're somewhere between letting it roam freely and, and at the other extreme, aiming to get all the way back down to zero and stay there. Um, so we're, we're somewhere in the middle. I don't think that the, the public health measures are doing that much to slow down. I think the, the biggest effect on transmission is actually immunity. Mm -hmm. And specifically for isolation of cases, it's only a minority of cases that are detected anyway, I think, and their contacts that are quarantined, but that's often a little bit slow. In the fifth wave, if you remember in the early days, infections were doubling every two to three days. And that was at the time when they were doing case finding and isolation and quarantine very stringently, very aggressively. That system broke down by mid-February. There were too many cases to handle. And the, the infection still doubled every two to three days. That suggests to me that isolation and quarantine is not making an enormous difference. I'm sure it's having an effect, but I don't think it's a major driver of, of control. Um, so I, whether or not the, the measures are, are strengthened with this, the new system, I don't think we'll see much change in, in transmission. But we may well see a peak soon just because immunity reaches a high enough level that we turn the corner. I hope that that doesn't coincide coincidentally with the introduction of the, the new measures because I, you know, we know that there will then be a, a causality attributed to that, which may not be uh, 
uh, a reasonable attribution. Um, I think one of the measures that does help is the testing in schools, yeah. the daily testing of children. I feel like the, the use of rapid tests on a daily basis uh, is something the government should probably pay for, rather than asking parents to pay for it themselves. But when we hear about the numbers of cases every day in children mm. and in the number of schools affected, those two numbers are normally quite similar. Erin would know better than me. Mm. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, 200, 300 cases in 250 schools or whatever. Yeah. You know, they're always quite, quite close, meaning that there's no large outbreaks, as, as far as we know, in schools. And if there is a large outbreak in a school, it tends to be still not that many children, and also something that's discussed in the press conference as something that's, that's unusual, right? Mm -hmm. They talk about, you know, six children in yeah. one class. And in other parts of the world, you have schools and classes where every kid got it. Mm -hmm. And, and that, was, that was the norm, actually. So daily testing is, is helping, for sure. But uh, the main reason that transmission is... Is, uh, is not rapid in Hong Kong. And the main reason we're going to have a peak in the sixth wave within, I guess, within the next month is because of the high level of immunity from infections and also from third doses. Uh, third doses do give a, at least a transient level of protection against infection. OK, um, because there are a lot of people um, in this room and, and online who probably some of us haven't been out from Hong Kong for, how, when was the last time you left Hong Kong? 2019. OK, what about you? No, I've travelled a little bit. Yeah. I've, I've done my quarantine. I'm, oh, you've done Yeah, yeah. I've, I've been out, uh, out and back a little bit. But yeah. uh, I know a lot of people haven't had a chance to travel. Yeah, um, yeah I, I've done one seven-day quarantine. I, I think I'm, I, I, you know, have the experience, got the sticker. Like, yeah, I think that, that was enough. I haven't for done me. quarantine. Yeah. I have never had a PCR test. I've never caught COVID. Wow. I mean, I just have the... Uh, oh, you don't know donuts. you didn't get COVID. <laughs> I'm going to get it. Yeah. I just haven't got it yet. I'm always wondering which one's going to come first. Is it the PCR test? Yeah. Or is it the COVID that tells me that I got yeah. uh, uh, the PCR test that tells me I got COVID? But yeah, at the moment, and I haven't done quarantine, so I'm dreading it if it ever happens. Yeah. So um, we, we uh, so I'm going to ask the question that everybody probably wants to ask. Um, um, we don't know how many days of quarantine there is or is not going to be. Is it at home? Is it a wristband? Which one is it? But looking at from scientific point of view, does the seven day quarantine serves its purpose? So that there's two stated reasons for on arrival quarantine in, in, in Hong Kong. The first reason is to, to make sure we don't have too many cases that need to be isolated or need to be hospitalized. And the second reason is to keep new variants out of Hong Kong. So the first reason for that, the, the first thing that I said was to, to make sure there's not too many people coming in that are, that are burdening our healthcare system. Many of those people are residents anyway, so it's, if, if they burn the healthcare system, it's a healthcare system that they've paid for with their taxes. But uh, even if there was a, a 10 times increase in travelers, and so we had 2,000 imported cases rather than 200, almost every imported case is mild. Very few need hospitalization, very few are severe, and can safely isolate at home. So that there's no actual necessary, there's no necessity for those imported cases to be a burden on us, even if travel increased by a factor of 10. The second reason for trying to keep new variants out of Hong Kong, basically it doesn't work. We've got 2.12.1, we've got BA4, we've got BA5, very soon after they've become prevalent in other parts of the world. And I'm sure BA2.75 will be here sooner or later. And the way that the viruses can get in, the new strains can get into Hong Kong, is either through transmission in quarantine hotels, or through infections of air crew, or hotel staff, or airport staff, lots of different ways they can get in. We can have stringent travel restrictions and we can push the number of travelers down to a very low level to delay the time at which those variants get into Hong Kong. And we could think about whether we want to delay 2.75 getting here. It looks like it's uh, uh, you know, the next one on, on the, the next bus in the line or whatever, the next, the next variant to, to spread. But uh, there, there's not necessarily an advantage to delaying that. Um, if we delayed it till the winter, we might be kicking ourselves for delaying it until the winter. Um, it might, might actually do less damage if it comes sooner. So I, I think we've got to be very careful about what are the reasons for on-arrival quarantine, because at the moment I don't think there's actually much argument for any of those travel-related measures. Okay. Mm, but they're still going to do it. <laughs> we're, we're not going to quit zero quarantine, in my opinion, anyway. Um, there's, there is so much invested now after what are we at, 18, 19 months of quarantine hotels? You I mean, we're up to 67 hotels now. There's an amazing amount of, like huge amount of like very rich companies that are involved mm -hmm. in the DQH system. 
to scrap it and we're not going to get any, if we're going to zero plus seven, say. So you do so zero, zero days in quarantine, but seven days at home with your yellow band. You're not going to get a lot of tourists that are going to do that, especially if they're going to have to spend it in a hotel anyway. So if to, to remove it completely, and like you said about the variants, while it won't stop it, they like to think that it'll stop it. So it, 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 I, I feel like it's going to be a hybrid of five, two or three, four. If, like, and for the rest of this year, like, if we went zero seven, then please delete this YouTube. Yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> the um, because this year 2020 seems to be going on. I think this is a third round of of year 2020. At least I can openly say that it has definitely affected my overall like mental health and you know how I'm you know do I have energy to do things and I don't think I have missed tweets from either one of you because at least from my survival mechanism is just to write read everything. So especially. Um, so what kind of message, I'm, I'm sure because you have so many followers, people will send you questions or messages or something. So what kind of, um, what, what kind of messages are you getting and what kind of things people want to share? And, and I'm sure that we have done some surveys in Hong Kong as well on the mental health uh, in Hong Kong under all of these uh, restrictions. A lot of the like, direct messages I get on Twitter are inbound travel related, like just trying to navigate that labyrinth. And no, no, I mean, I sit there looking at it all day and it still confuses me. It, I, I, I will make it, I'm like, oh my God, sorry, we've changed that rule now, it's now this rule. But I help them out and they do that. Then there's other people, you know, somebody's in quarantine and sends me that Cordis uh, IT mistake where they accidentally loaded the five day uh, meal scheme. So they, they, they feel like five day uh, quarantine is coming soon because their IT is built. So, I mean, I get a fair few stories like DM to me and uh, like the the other one was the person who tested rat positive on arrival at um, HKIA and had to sleep on a cot mm. for the night and then got sent to um, uh, sit at Novotel City Gate the next day. Um, but it was just interesting to find out what that process is because I haven't left. So I don't know what everybody's going through unless they tell me. So I like to put out those threads to find out. That's what most of them are doing. I get all sorts of messages on Twitter. Yeah. I get some really angry ones sometimes. Uh, ang mm -hmm. Angry, angry, nasty messages, and then other times I get some very nice ones. Yeah. Some random person wrote me a very nice letter after my uh, newspaper article about vaccine mandates. So I was very, very happy. It wasn't so for you, right? It wasn't so for you. Oh, okay. Just checking. <laughs> no. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I, yeah. But but, has, uh, but I think HKU has done at least one study on everyone's like mental health and and, and well-being during COVID. Because I remember seeing your tweet yeah. about it, and then I answered the questionnaire, and then. No, I mean, Hong Kong are very resilient people. People in Hong Kong are very resilient. But uh, the, there's a lot of fatigue with the public health measures, um, which I think people are all looking forward to, to the end of those measures. Um, but it's very difficult to, to, to really to, to have a, a complete handle on all of the underlying reasons why. I mean, some people are, are very scared of COVID. And actually, if we were to suddenly relax a lot of public health measures, there'd be a different issue with a lot of people then panicking about getting COVID. Um, at the minute, it's, it's a lot of people who are frustrated by the, by the restrictions that are in place. Um, I have a feeling I've seen statistics that suicides have been going up, unfortunately. Um, and that's, that's very sad to hear. Um, and then separately, apart from the mental health issue, I'm also looking at the data on other diseases and other causes of, of hospitalizations and deaths in Hong Kong. And it's kind of interesting so far. We, we've only got the data for 2020 so far. Mm -hmm. But what, one of the things that we've observed is a, a decrease in people hospitalized with cardiovascular diseases, mm -hmm. but an increase in deaths mm -hmm. from cardiovascular diseases. Mm -hmm. And it kind of fits because of the reduced healthcare seeking and the reduced propensity to seek medical care for people mm -hmm. with heart issues, maybe. Mm -hmm. And then they died, unfortunately. Yeah. So that's. I think in 2020, 2021 and 2022, we're going to see even more of that, unfortunately, yeah. with cancer as well. Yeah. People delaying their treatments yeah. and diabetes yeah. and all sorts of other quantitative diseases. So although we're doing a, a, a reasonable job in the first two years of controlling COVID, mm -hmm. there's been all of these other unintended consequences um, of, of the measures mm -hmm. uh, on people's health and well-being, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, because if you go to, let's say, a hospital for something or to a doctor, you have to get a COVID test. And if you get a COVID test, uh, yeah. 
then it, well, it, all sorts of things put people off, and they maybe they yeah. don't want to go to hospital because they're worried about getting COVID in the hospital. Oh, right. I mean, all sorts of reasons. And, and there was a period of time when hospitals didn't even allow people to go in. Right? They yeah. were they were all you know, refusing patients and sending people away. So even in the latest press conferences, they're talking about if cases go to this, we're going to have to remove this amount of services. services. Yeah. And then if you, so I mean that sort of message goes out to the public who read the newspaper and go, oh well, I won't be able to go to a hospital, and they delay. Yeah. I mean, the, the idea is to scare people into sort of less social contact and bring the case numbers down, but there's always a, another unintended consequence. Yeah. Okay, so instead of asking what happens next or what is the exit strategy, because we, we don't have answers on, on this stage, uh, let me ask, what are the things that the people who are deciding on the next measures and the exit strategy have to take into account? And will there be rugby sevens? <laughs> for, for Maybe. Me, yeah, <laughs> I told you that was going to be my answer. <laughs> Maybe. For me, one of the things really is the lead time. That we've seen that in Europe, there's chaos in the airports because the airports laid off a lot of employees mm -hmm. and didn't prepare for the surge in travel that's now happening. If Hong Kong is going to have quarantine travel in November, mm -hmm. the airport needs to know pretty soon to start hiring because otherwise it's going to be chaos in the airport. And, and lots of other things need a lot of lead time to prepare for. Uh, we saw the, the places that successfully exited from zero COVID, Singapore, Australia, to some extent, New Zealand, um, all had a plan in place. Now, the plan still can be changed later, but there were timelines in there and plans in there that businesses could look at and get prepared for. And in Hong Kong, we don't have a timeline yet for that. So that, that suggests to me that there's no imminent change anticipated. Although there's a discussion of quarantine-free travel in November, at least for bankers, uh, that may be the only group and only for that meeting. And we may have to wait some time longer for, for quarantine-free travel uh, to, to materialize for the rest of us. Mm. Or we could change, uh, change jobs to, to, to work in banking and then yeah. <laughs> yeah. benefit from that policy. Yeah. <laughs> but, so, but what about the sevens? Do you think it will go ahead? I, d I, I don't know. What, what I heard is that the, 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 the world rugby probably wouldn't be that enthusiastic yeah. about, about uh, letting the rugby players come to Hong Kong under the circumstances that they would be uh, forced to comply with in Hong Kong. So I suspect it will be postponed uh, again. And then the next one is scheduled for next Easter, because it's usually at, at about Easter. Yeah. And this is already delayed till, till November. I suspect that may not go ahead, but next Easter will be the next one they have to start thinking ahead to, whether that one can go ahead. Um, because it's not that far away. I did see the World Snooker Tournament uh, mm. is going to do uh, Hong Kong in October. Oh. They announced it on Twitter. And okay. I'm like, I don't know how many of the players are going to be willing to do the quarantine, but they're going ahead. They announced it, and that's in October. That's well earlier than what uh, LCM mm. has said. Uh, his maybe November date. Mm. So, I mean, if that goes ahead, I've, I also saw that there's concerts now going back out to Asia World Arena, mm -hmm. which uh, have been off for two years. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. who knows? Okay, and uh, now we have time for <laughs> questions, and I can see several hands up already. Please uh, be kind and keep the questions very brief because we know that we have a lot of people with questions, but the uh, uh, gentleman at the back, he, he was definitely the first one. And, yeah. And please state your name and your affiliation. Uh, Rob Rouse, every Monday on RTHK and every fortnight in the SCMP. But it's good to see you back. Hope to get you on the show again soon. Mm -hmm. um, recently, about two weeks ago, Singapore had 24,500 cases in one day. Mm. I saw the health minister interviewed on TV, and he shrugged and said, yeah, this is part of the price of opening up, and we're coping. On the same day, by coincidence, Hong Kong had about one-tenth of the same number of cases, about two and a half thousand, and at the daily press conference it was Armageddon. Uh, it's the end of the world. Uh, we're all going to die. We're all going to die. Um, what explains... These are two Chinese communities. What explains this difference, if you can? And what about the hospital admission policies? If Singapore was a, had the same admission policy as us, there wouldn't be any other patients in any Singapore hospital for any other reason. Yeah. COVID would have all of the beds. Uh, 
Do your best, Ben. No, this is, this is, it, it, it's a, a different perspective maybe on COVID. Where in Singapore, they, they said uh, more than a year ago that they had this plan to transition away from zero COVID because they felt it was not sustainable. And so they'd have to accept lots of infections, but they wanted those infections to be as mild as possible. And the way to achieve that was to get vaccine coverage as high as possible. And they did get vaccine coverage. They have got vaccine coverage to a very high level. In Hong Kong, we're still operating under the, the scenario where COVID is something to be minimized. Um, although we were not actually able to, to, to really minimize it, unfortunately, as we saw in the fifth wave. And so that, that's where the, the complication occurs. And you're right that in, in Singapore, they wisely decide not to admit every mild case. It's not necessary. In, in Singapore, though, and in Hong Kong, we will have problems with the healthcare capacity. You know, we have every year in the flu surge. It, before COVID, there was a flu surge every winter and the hospital struggled. That's not new. And that's going to happen again with COVID in the future in Singapore and most likely in Hong Kong in years to come. The, it, it's just a problem for hospitals when there's a lot of um, moderately sick people all at the same time. And in Hong Kong, we have a specific issue with elderly homes where even residents of elderly homes with mild COVID can't stay in the home. They need somewhere to go. And at the minute, there's nowhere else for them to go apart from hospitals typically. So in the fifth wave, actually, a lot of hospital beds were occupied by people who didn't really need to be in hospital because of their disease severity. They were there for isolation because they couldn't stay in the elderly home. And that's something that we really need to figure out a better plan for uh, in the longer term, because otherwise every winter we're going to have trouble because it, it, it happens for flu as well. But for flu, they, they typically will not um, will not pay so much attention to removing flu cases from elderly homes. But with COVID, they have done. So if, if in the past there was a flu outbreak in an elderly home, it's just an unfortunate occurrence, you know, an unfortunate fact of life. And then a lot of people in the elderly home get it. With COVID, as soon as there's a case, they move them out, but there's nowhere to move them. So we need a, a, a plan for that and a strategy for that. Most likely new facilities for, for um, isolation and quarantine of, of residents of elderly homes. But it's not easy to, 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 to make that kind of thing happen. They're kind of using sports centers. Yeah, they, they sent some to Asia World Expo, right? Yeah. Then and, or they had. They had. And then yeah. they've now re reactivated two sports centers, which are yeah. isolation facilities only for residential care yeah, homes. It's not ideal. It's really not yeah. ideal. I mean, they're basketball courts. Yeah, it's really not. Mm. Um, and I, I, I know that older people really struggle when they're moved from their, the place they're familiar with mm. to somewhere very new, maybe with different people looking after them. Um, it, it can be very tough. And that can really affect their quality of life and also their life expectancy mm. unfortunately that you know d d notwithstanding covid just being moved about and disrupted in in their routine can have a big impact on on, pe on people's lives in some cases okay M more questions um gentlemen here oh, thanks my name is dan i work for an investment fund here um there have been some reports in the press um just sort of generally that the new variants, BA4 and BA5, uh, are actually are uh, able to, basically, that sort of existing immunity from vaccines and from previous infections with earlier variants provides uh, not at all zero, but, but significantly less protection mm -hmm. against the new variants. Uh, and if most of Hong Kong's cases are of the older variants, if they were to open up and BA4 and BA5 were to eventually, inevitably, get into Hong Kong, how do you think about the risks Yep. and protections that people have from Got it. existing vaccines. So there's a study from Qatar just recently published where they estimate actually for BA2, it gives almost 80% protection against infection with BA4, BA5. And in Hong Kong, we had our fifth wave of BA2. So actually, in that sense, we were in a pretty good position in Hong Kong compared to other parts of the world where there was a lot of BA1 that maybe stopped BA2. But now because BA1 doesn't protect against BA4, BA5, they're having a lot of BA4, BA5. So at the minute, we're, we're OK. But then the next thing to come along, we may be in a worse position again. It may be the situation that BA2 doesn't protect us, uh, especially when it was so long ago. But, but in Europe, they have a BA4, BA5. They're OK for a while. So I think we're going to see ups and downs around the world. Uh, for Hong Kong, we already have BA4, BA5 in the community. There's a lot of unlinked cases every day, right? Yeah. And uh, I, I don't think that the, the reason those haven't exploded must be because of immunity. There's, there's no other reason. Like seventy percent of two twelve one was unlinked, and about how many 85? a day? Unlinked? There was fifty eight uh, yeah. cases yesterday. Forty were un so, and BA four five. There was twenty four cases, nine linked, fifteen unknown. Source. So it's a minority of all the confirmed cases, but it's a lot of unlinked cases. Yeah, oh yeah, they've um, got no idea where they're coming. Yeah. From. Okay. Um, 
Okay, next question, Mr. Tim Huxley. Thank you, Tim Huxley, uh, second vice president. Uh, in January, one of our respected legislators said that um, living, uh, going against, uh, well, suggesting that we live with COVID and not going along with zero COVID would be considered a breach of the national security law. Um, how has the politicization of this whole public health issue hindered a potential recovery with the economy on its knees as it is? I think sometimes it must make things more difficult to discuss because of the, the threats of being, um, being accused of various offences by simply stating scientific facts, which are maybe uncomfortable facts for the administration. Um, but I, I don't think that, that COVID itself is the major target of the national security law at the moment, at the moment. Um, so I, I, I always, for, for myself personally, always try to, to stick to the, the science and communicate scientific results. But uh, certainly I know there's a lot of other experts who are put off from commentating and discussing and sharing their knowledge because they're, that they're worried about being uh, the target of, of some kind of you know, campaign that, that we've seen in, in, uh, happen from time to time. So I, I would say it's not ideal, but uh, I, I don't think there's a direct correlation between that aspect of the Hong Kong society and the control of the pandemic, per se. I think we could still do a very good job in controlling the pandemic, um, it, 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 yeah, depending on, 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 on the, the, the future path taken by the administration. No, I got nothing. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not touching in this. <laughs> okay. Uh, is there anyone at the back? Because th this is a wall. I cannot see. Is there someone with their hand up? Okay. Yeah. There. Okay. There's a people pointing. Yeah. Yeah, ma'am. Thank you, uh, Annette Johnson, correspondent member. Um, I have a question for Ben. Uh, two decades almost. Of Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Is it on? Yeah. Yep. Um, uh, yeah, two decades almost of work uh, mm. looking into epidemics and preventing another SARS or being prepared for another SARS. I'm just wondering, how has the Hong Kong government taken advantage of that um, that work you've done? How have you been involved in helping the government to shape their prevention policies and vaccine um, readiness. Sure. Well, so, so SARS had a big impact in Hong Kong in 2003. And as a consequence of SARS, there was actually a lot of investment, not only in the work that, that I do in epidemiology, but also in laboratory sciences, in laboratory capacity, in infection control in the hospitals, in isolation rooms in the hospitals, and in the public health capacity. The CHP was created after SARS. So that put us in a very good position compared to our regional neighbors, particularly to, to respond to COVID in the early days. Um, and I think that's why in the first, at least the first year, the first even two years, Hong Kong was seen as, as doing a really, really good job against COVID. And that was because of the infrastructure that we have in place in Hong Kong as a result of the investments after SARS. Uh, for, for me personally, um, I've been in close communication with government officials since the beginning on situational awareness and on, uh, on, on various different uh, sources of evidence and, and information and advice. And I continue to do that. So I share quite freely my thoughts with, with uh, the government, but they don't always, uh, don't, yeah, I mean, they, they have a, a lot of other considerations, obviously. And I, I would hope that uh, in, in the future, there would be more advice, not only from medical doctors and epidemiologists, but also from other disciplines, social science and economics and so on. Because although I'm a public health person, I can see that a lot of the, the advice and the discussions about COVID policies are from a medical and a public health perspective and not so much from the other side. And I would very much like to be the public health person in a room of a lot of different people. And I will put the case forward for public health but other people would put the case forward for economics. At the moment, it seems like it's mostly public health and medical people that are, that are the strongest voices in, in advisory groups. 
What about you, Aaron? Because you have watched how many press conferences is it now? 499. 400. So today <laughs> is the lucky 500. Lucky 500 for yeah. CHP. So, so do you remember that the, how the, um, the conversation around these measures, has it changed during the, or has the SARS been mentioned before the beginning of the pandemic? Uh, not sure. I mean, you can see when there's a government policy change, mm -hmm. the wording that's used in the CHP uh, health uh, hospital authority press conference changes. Mm -hmm. So when when we change when we went through the waves, uh, the, the fifth wave, the wording at the beginning, like you're saying, is like we can stop this, we can stop this, we can stop this. Okay, we can't stop this. Mm -hmm. uh, so the wording change from we're going to COVID zero to it's a dynamic COVID zero, and then it's like uh, we're going to do this, this, and even right now, like uh, and somebody asked earlier. When the cases are like to 2,000, like two weeks ago, they kept saying it's a mild disease, it's fine, very few people are getting sick, there's deaths, and, and then there was this pivot with the new government after LCM came out, and uh, I think he wrote a blog. And then you could hear the tone change in the, from the CHP and HA people to it's, we're being overwhelmed, the hospital system is starting to put in their their uh, emergency plans. Then we had the Secretary for Health on Tuesday come out with his graphs and say, like, if we're at 25% here, if uh, we hit the 50% of cases, then this is how many uh, elective surgeries are going to get cancelled and that. Mm -hmm. So the, the language always changes. And the, the, it's always a pretty good uh, sort of way to figure out where the government's going. OK, we have time for one more brief question. Mm -hmm. Uh, gentleman over there. Oh, hi, Cesare. I'm a lecturer at HKU. And I just want to end on a kind of big picture question, which is how will we know when the pandemic is over? Like, What signals are you looking for, Ben and Aaron, that will tell us this is done and normal life can resume? So I, it, it's, it's, it's not an easy question mm -hmm. because th there's no, th there's nothing to base that kind of decision on. Um, I know in, in many countries, they've basically relaxed all of their public health measures now. Very little is being done. And so even when cases rise, like they are in Europe and in the US at the moment, there's not that much being done to respond to it. And in a way, that's a, a, a signal that they think the pandemic's over for them because they're, they're not going to do any, any more pandemic mode stuff. But actually, I think they've even gone too far because I think there is a role for public health measures even in epidemics. There is for seasonal flu. In Hong Kong, we've closed schools in the past for flu epidemics and done other measures for flu epidemics. And in the future, I'm sure countries will decide to do, to do things for, for COVID. But because of the blowback from, from two years of quite stringent measures, I think countries are reluctant to bring any of those measures back now. So for, for me, actually, for most of the world, the pandemic has ended. But for some parts of the world, that there's a reluctance to say the pandemic's ended for one reason or another. And in Hong Kong, it may be because if the pandemic was said to be over, then there wouldn't be any rationale for continuing any of these measures. So, of course, the, the pandemic's not, not going to be declared over for a while. But uh, actually, if, if we were to measure the, the level of immunity in Hong Kong and compare that to other parts of the world in Hong Kong, we're at a pretty good level. Um, even if we relaxed a lot of measures now, uh, we'd have more infections but I don't think we'd, we'd face the kind of uh, public health threat that's in Australia right now with flu as well as COVID and hospitals really struggling. Um, I think we're actually in a better position now because what they're, they're facing is, is another exit wave. Um, we had an enormous exit wave already. And so the worst has passed, in my opinion, for Hong Kong. And actually, it would be relatively safe to think about transitioning away from zero COVID now um, and declaring the pandemic over. But uh, yeah, f for me, I, I, I would say it's, uh, it's time to, <laughs> to, to, to call it a transition to, to epidemic COVID. And COVID will be back from time to time, hopefully not too often. But uh, in other parts of the world, it seems to be coming back every few months with a new strain. And people seem to get it ev every, every year or so. Um, and we know what we can do to reduce our risk. Uh, we could wear masks. We're not wearing a mask because we're at a table eating and drinking. Yeah. But as soon as we stand up, we have to wear our mask. Mm -hmm. But uh, in, I'd, I'd be perfectly fine with the idea of people being recommended to keep wearing masks if they want to yeah. reduce their risk of COVID, get vaccinated. Uh, we have antiviral drugs, which are very effective. 
and uh, the, the government not having too much mandates anymore, just having recommendations of good behaviours. Any recommendations on good behaviour? <laughs> okay. No, that sounds all good to me. Okay, uh, thank you very much both. We don't let anyone leave uh, from the FCC without a little Ooh. gift. So we have little gift bags for you. You can get these from downstairs. And we also have the 40 years on Ice House Street edition of these. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. You. And may we have a round of applause to our Honda. Thank you.